All right, I'm going to call the committee of the whole meeting to order on Tuesday, January 14th, 2020, um, 5.03 p.m. Roll call. Alder Persons Madden. Here. Kubaki. Here. Inglehart. Here. Capusta. Here. Borgman. Here. Hamill. Here. And Wolf. Here. We have a quorum present. Thank you. And then statement of public notice. This meeting was noticed in accordance with the open meeting law. Um, and then we have approval of the November 12th, 2019 minutes. Move to approve. Second. Second. Any discussion on the minutes? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Minutes are approved. And then we have uh, one, two, three, four, five new business items. Um, we will start with the uh, discuss the transfer of a reserve Class B liquor license to the village of Hales Corners. San Sandy Kulik is and, here. Could you just come up and tell us? Um, tell hopefully us. the microphone is on. If not, Adam can help. No, it is. You got yep. it? Okay. Go. Hi, I'm Sandy Kulik. I'm the village administrator for the village of Hales Corners. We have reached out to your attorney and your clerk, and we're looking to purchase a reserve Class B license, which under the law as long as you're within two miles of a contiguous border, and you are one of them. So we have 13 regular licenses and three reserved. They've all been issued for years, so we have nothing available. A local restaurateur approached us for a Mexican-themed restaurant on Highway 100, and we were looking to procure a license for that establishment. Do you have Thank you. And, and you this is something that when you, when you look at the law, it's definitely clear that another municipality can ask us for this. Um, there is a classification here that you would make a determination on how much to charge for that license, but you can't charge under $10,000. So you start at $10,000 and then you go from there. Um, so it would be $10,000 plus um, whatever it costs to issue a license for us. So um, that's kind of where it's at. We have 12 reserve licenses that we're holding right now. So the chance of us going through all our licenses and another 11 is probably not that great. So for us to give up just one license is not that big of a deal. So once we give this up, it's gone forever? Um, yes, once we give the license up, it becomes their license. Um, we get the initial issuance fee, mm -hmm. but then they keep the license and they're able to renew it and issue it as if it's their own license. Okay, how, how many licenses have we uh, issued in the last couple of years? Jill, any idea? Oh, I had that sheet. Oh, we yeah, have, and I we did have this. Fire and we have I don't that. think I brought it either. Well, we, right we have, I think I we have 37 Class B liquor licenses, and I believe we have 33 or 34 issued. So we still have regular licenses available to issue. Okay. Not the reserves, the regular. Correct. Right. Okay, now wait, wait. I think you got to explain the breakdown to them. We, yeah, what's, we all what's, the, there's what's two the difference different kinds. between a regular license and a reserve license? Back in, I think, 1997, um, state law had all the municipalities create a quota for their Class B licenses. And so um, we had to go through this formula, which Jeff knows was really it, complicated. It's a long calculation. And I think at that time we lost a few regular licenses and so they became reserve licenses. The reserve license is a license that a municipality can issue. The minimum license fee or issuance fee is $10,000 plus the license fee. And so it was a way to, I guess, curb some of the licenses that the municipalities had at the time. It was kind of done by the Tavern League. Right. They were concerned about licenses, too much competition. So they decided to come up with this formula back to 1997. And then all the municipalities calculated how many reserve licenses they would have. And that's kind of where we sit today. So we started back then with three. And you gain, with the increase in your population, you gain... I think an extra one for every 500 increase in population. So now we're at 12. So we have regular licenses in addition to 12 reserve licenses? Yes, like in Hales Corner's case, they issued all their licenses. We still have regular licenses we could issue. I think we have three or four. What is the population in Hales Corners? 7,900 approximately. 7,900? 7, 7,900. Huh. Yeah, we, uh, odds of us growing another 500 unless we go straight in the air is, is not <laughs> gonna happen. There's no place to build anything. 
Well, my concern is, is that we still have the area in Racine to develop, which it depends on New Berlin, what they're gonna do along the freeway stretch. We have all of 36 yet to develop. Um, I don't know, how many licenses do you say we have regular license right now? I believe we have three or four. Three or four that we and could 12 issue. reserve? And 12 reserve, which would bring it down to 11 if we transfer one to Hales Corners. So that says how, how many how many do we have available total? Did you say the reserve and the and the other one together? I'm reserve sorry. right now twelve. Twelve and and seven. I believe three or four, oh, three or four of the 12. regular so 15. licenses. We'd have about fifteen, but remember on the on the reserve licenses, that's a fee of ten thousand dollars. Right. So there's there's not a guarantee someone could right get that fee. It's a that it's a be. little more rare that th those go because they're ten thousand dollars. It's like a deterrent almost that those go. Oh. I did go have ahead. one more go ahead. Um, because one of the questions this is the second municipality I've approached just for full disclosure of what's going on around us. New Berlin has like 15, I believe West Dallas has 20 something available. Yeah, West Dallas, I'm, there's they're out there, and I'm just trying. I want to stay kind of with you know, salaries we've worked with in the past, plus they have to be within our you know, within our area. One of the things that that uh, West Dallas is, is considering at this time, and I think it's a reasonable <coughs> consideration is in the event that that license would become re-available, that we would return it to you. You'd have to pay us the same $10,000 or whatever that minimum fee is or whatever that is about restoring that license to the municipality that we received it from. They were looking into the legality of that. The village board has no no concerns whatsoever about that being an issue. I did know if you read all the way down, there's a section of the statute that says you can only transfer three, period, mm -hmm. to Correct. anyone. Okay. So it's not like you could transfer all 12, ever. Um, so the odds of Village of Hales Court is ever securing enough to have three more available, we can't even find one. Cor so. Correct, but I'm not sure if you want to entertain the thought of paying $10,000 to get our original license well, back. Saying, no, I understand. Yeah, that was just but something well, it would just be a wash. That's right? something to think about. Yeah. yeah. You know. You have to be available, too. And it's, you know, yep. right. We'd have to have them available. You'd have to have it available, right. right. Yeah. I mean, I don't think I have a concern with, with doing this. I just have a long-term concern of where we'll be at in the future as a community if we do keep growing. I mean, uh, and we are growing, and we are much larger than Hales Corners. We just don't have the visible retail stretch that they have at this point. Well, the other side of that is that as the commercial individual grows, our population will go along with that, so that'll replenish licenses. So I don't have a problem releasing a license. I just want to know how flush they are in, uh, in the village. You know? <laughs> the, the business that's being rec right, um, that's securing this, trust me, it's not Bob's Corner shot the beer thing. It's, uh -huh. it's not that. He owns 20 separate um, restaurants of this type in the Milwaukee County area, and they're all successful. Great. So I, I have no concern that this is going to be a going concern. I have no, yeah, none. I don't want to identify who it is until after we get here. Yeah, because sure. No, I just don't feel that's appropriate, but yeah. So. so your motivation is your your village is just stuck at this point? We are. We yeah. are. If we can't procure a license, then the options that he yeah. would have left, carbon as a theme, is just for beer and wine. And mm -hmm. he is looking to do, you know, margaritas. It's, it's mm -hmm. a Mexican, you know, a Mexican theme. So he is pursuing a full license at this time. I, th I think you're right, Kevin. I think with the uh, population and the growth that was mentioned before, I think I think we're probably pretty safe. Yeah. Make a motion to approve. So this is committee of the whole, so. Uh, well, that's okay. Yep. We can take right. an motion. Oh. It's it's still a this motion. would come back to. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, what's the recommendation? Is there a second right. to that? Can you second, mm -hmm. lady? Yeah, I second okay. that. Any more discussion on that? Any Any recommendation as to what? amount that you want to yeah. charge? As much as we can get. <laughs> <laughs> Sky's the limit on that one. It's it's ten thousand is the minimum. There's uh, been very limited transfers. The only ones that I'm aware of is the city of I'm sorry, the town of Brookfield to the town of Lisbon, mm -hmm. and then there was something up in Ashwabanon. Those are the only ones. So that's, so it sounds like ten thousand is the going rate. Yeah. It may not be. I, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna. I mean, if it's very limited, you know. I have never seen one of these until Sandy brought it to my attention. <laughs> yeah. 
you so, might, I mean, so there's no history to go it's, on. It's not no, common. No, I don't have anything to go on. Yeah, it is not, it is not common. My, and I, and I want to quote as clearly as I know what Brookfield contacted us looking for one too, and I just had them like, seriously. Yeah, I'd, up something. I'd, say like, ten, I'd say 10,000 plus let's, costs. Let's be a good neighbor. Oh, is that yeah, 10,000 plus I, costs? If yeah, they were I, reversed, my I, guess is yeah. you'd want it to be. I, I think the 10,000 is reasonable because well, that's what we I'm don't thinking. need to. Okay. Thank you. Plus whatever fees or what have you. I do also have a sample from the DOR that I can draft and send to you. Okay, that's good. Okay. Thank you, Sandy. Thank, thank, thank you for coming. Yep. Thank you. Oh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, almost forgot that Here. important piece. <laughs> Okay, then, then we have the presentation uh, by Rupert Milkey for the city water study. Is this going to be up on our screens? Are we going to go up on? Um, are we going to have this on our screens? Yep. It's gonna our be on screens it. here? It'll, be on, it'll flip on the screens here, okay. and Just it'll be on sure. everyone's screen so that okay. everyone can see it. There it is. <clears throat> Does everybody have it on their own respective screens? Mm -hmm. Yep, I do. Great. Okay. Well, good evening. I'm uh, Don Hakala. I'm an engineer with Rupert and Milky, and I'll be presenting uh, the uh, general overview of the water system study that uh, we and the, and the staff here work together on to uh, try to develop a plan for the next 20, 30 years. So, a summary of the water study uh, that is we there's multiple main components. Uh, we review the existing water system facilities. Uh, Reviewed the existing and future population and community growth to establish the basis of where where we, at least at that time, envisioned the community growth and the population would go. Uh, we reviewed the water requirements of current and projecting future water requirements based on po future community population and growth. Uh, analyzed the existing current supply system and 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 the existing storage system and compared that uh, existing storage and supply system to future projections for water, water requirements. Uh, based on the future water requirement projections uh, and the water supplies and storage and analysis, we developed some recommendations. Uh, but then based on the recommendations, we established the cost uh, based on those recommendations and developed a capital improvement plan. The existing water system facilities for the city of Mosquito consists of uh, supply and storage facilities, which includes nine ground, groundwater wells, two elevated storage, uh, elevated water storage tanks, one ground level storage reservoir, three and three booster pump stations. And within the f water distribution system, there's four pressure zones that are use, utilized to provide adequate pressure to the various areas within the, within the city. The largest pressure zone by far is the main service zone. Then there's the Hillendale boosted zone, and some smaller zones are the Chamberlain Hill boosted, the smallest two zones are the Chamberlain Hill boosted zone and then the Commerce area boosted zone. So the map is probably not the, the best, but presentation value, you can see it. The, the outlined pink area that you see in the map is basically what, what we delineated as the current service area of the water system. Um, there's some symbology on, on here uh, I don't know if you can see my pointer going here, probably not. Um, but it shows the general general location of wells as the uh, the W, uh, the round blue structures are where the tanks are located, and the green dot, green squares with the dots in them are where the gen general location of the booster station facilities. So on to population and community growth. Uh, we wanted to take a look at the population in the, in the uh, city here. So we, we had to take a look at it in two, two different ways. We had to look at the total entire population for the city. And since the retail water service isn't provided to all customers or all people within the city, we had to come up with an establish, come up and establish a, an estimate of how much, what the population that the water system currently serves. So this, the, Graph, the chart on the page, the blue line shows the historical overall city population. The red line represents the projected future population, which, is, which came from the Wisconsin Department of Administration. And the, <coughs> excuse me, and the green line represents an, represents an estimate of what we calculated as the, our best guess as, as the retail water service area population. That was based on the number of residential water service customers, 
the, and the census data of popul population density per household and an estimate of the number of uh, dwelling units for a multifamily to come up with an estimated population for the water service area. So once we established the population, we then looked at the land use. And so we categorized the existing and future land use based on the information that was, consider that was included in the uh, comprehensive plan that was adopted in 2009. So we used the existing land use to estimate the land use for the existing service area and divided that divide that by each pressure zone. Then we looked at the future land, land use in that comprehensive plan and developed projections for in land use based on it in the year of 2030 and 2050 after discussions with, with, with Scott and Scott where we thought it would potentially be where growth would potentially occur in, these time, in this time period. So in this uh, graphical display here, the orange colored uh, area is where the existing service area is right now. Now there's a light, light blue areas represent what we, what, after discussing with the staff, where we thought we would potentially be using or serving in, in by 2030. And those blue areas are, are existing community water systems that have, I, I guess, potentially could have some water quality or some issues that were, they thought they might want to come into the to the city's water system. Now, the dark green areas are areas for future development that we that the existing water service area is is within the water service area that we thought would where development would occur in further in the future between 2030 and 2050. So, then there's there's some ha crosshatch patterns which kind of identify the limitation of what areas can be served by the main service zone. And those crosshatch patterns identify that there would be a, a need for boosted pressure because the existing elevated storage facilities that establish the pressure for the water distribution system do not have a high enough elevation to provide suitable pressures, which are minimum, minimum pressure of 35 PSI from the DNR under normal service conditions. So that's hence the reason why over in the western portion of the city, we have the Hill and Dale boosted zone where we have the booster pump station, which boosts the pressure to provide the desirable level of, of service. And as in the far northwest corner of, the, of that requires an additional boosting area. And after discussion with the city, with the water, water staff, we didn't figure that would be an area where we would have, that the village would ever serve water because it requires an additional boosting beyond the water, the, the pressure that is currently uh, provided by the Hillendale zone. So in the water requirements, we reviewed the existing water consumption that, and summarized it from the period of 2007 through 2018. Uh, we categorized it based on the, the, the sales um, groups that are in the PSC report and we summarized that uh, per year. And after we got that kind of, as we can see in the chart here, residential water consumption is by far the largest, largest um, area of water consumption in the city. So using the land use data that we had established in their pop, in the land use evaluation and the population data, in order to establish future projections, we looked at it as in two ways. We can look at it as gallons per acre per day. So we established a unit consumption value based on residential, commercial, and industrial and public water uses on existing, based on existing land use and established a rate of water consumption. And then based on the estimated water service area population, we established a rate in, in gallons per capita per day for residential, commercial, industrial, and public to establish future water consumption values based on either population or future land use. So it can work either way if we know something's going to develop in the future and this is going to be land, this land use category that doesn't necessarily follow what we anticipated here, we can use these values in the future to say, hey, this is a good starting point. We're gonna have 40 acres of commercial development occur in this area. What are we gonna, based on our existing facilities or existing water use, we can at least get a good ballpark idea when we categorize it by acreage where we think water use could be in the future. As our water requirements, as we identified, looked at those historical water requirements, we also looked at what the maximum day the daily demand variations have occurred over those last multiple, last uh, 12 years. Um, 2012 was the high uh, 
a high year that if we all remember correctly, that was a very dry year and almost every community in Southeast Wisconsin had their maximum day ever occur for the long times over in 2012. Um, did a little st statistical analysis. Um, since that was a rare year, we looked at it at this as a 98% confidence mm -hmm. level and established a 276% ratio to the average day, which basically means that this would, there's a 2% chance that the maximum day would exceed that, that ratio that we selected here. But, so we also established a peak hour ratio of 160% of the maximum of the day. So normally water systems are, are, are designed based on average day, maximum of the day, and then trying to meet peak hour demand. So using those, those ratios, we developed, the way we established the future water use is we looked at the acreage that was, pro that was pro projected in that 2050 plan in the service areas that we identified for 2030 and 2050, calculated the, the acreage of residential, public, commercial, multifamily, and industrial, established a factor that we, based on the historical demand use for the acreage, and then made projections so we could get projections of water use for 2030 based on what we thought was going to occur and, and the incremental increase from 2030 to 24, 2050. And then the table on your left establishes our metered sales. Then the table on your right will, we use the factors to get us an annual pumpage, which was a ratio between how much is sold and how much is pumped. Looked at that historical then we calculated our maximum a day pumpage for the projections and then de and, eval and developed a peak hour demand for future, future conditions. So that, that was established the basis of our future projections. Now looking at the future projections, we wanted to make sure that what we have for your existing reliable supply and storage areas, how, how adequate is it for current facilities and for future development. So this table has a lot of information on it, but Basically, your average, your, based on the 2017 um, demand data, which was representative and really close to 2018 data, your system has more than adequate capacity to accommodate current demand on reliable supply for your well systems. Combining your supply and your storage, we, we evaluated that together because Storage is typically used to help accommodate peak hour demands, provide firefighting reserve, and some, uh, and some provide the, the wells some operating storage and our operating reserve so they have some, an operating range so they can turn on, turn off, and cycle. So looking at what we have for supply in each of the, the main zone and the, the other boosted zones, we evaluated what their supply capacity was compared with the storage capacity and determined that Right now, they, you have adequate supply capacity and have adequate storage capacity for current demands. We also did the same analysis for projected demands in 2030. Um, existing supply, your existing wells are suitable and the storage for the main service zone are, are suitable for demands that are projected. These are obviously projections. We don't, if we, uh, things can, can change, but based on what we're projecting, it's adequate for, for 20, 20, 30 demands. There is a slight shortfall in, in available storage in the, in the Hill, Hill and Dale booster zone, boosted zone, but that's projecting that, hey, if, if we have demands that are ex getting up to that point, we we'll might want to evaluate getting a little more storage sooner, or if that the sm sm slight storage deficiency doesn't mean that you're, you're really out of it because you've got, there's other, other means to take care of that. So, but it's not a huge deal for 1,600 gallons. So in 2050, we looked at the supply for projected demand. Now this is where we see it, where we start to see a uh, deficiency. The, um, there isn't an ad enough reliable capacity for the well systems to meet this future demand. And then, at the, and then, we, then we're starting to see a deficiency in main service zone storage and the Hillendale zone storage, because if you remember the chart from before, the, in the western, northwestern portion of the city where there was a big gr green area in the northwestern portion, that would be a, most of it in the Hillendale zone. 
that's a major, that would be a major expansion to the Hill, Hill and Dale zone. So that's why there would be a deficiency there and require some storage. And then the deficiency in, in, in the main service zone would be because they're in the, in the southeast portion of the city in the dark green area on that, on that figure, that was a large expansion of the water system down there. So that's where that, where that would occur. So recommendations. Uh, recommendations in water supply improvements. Uh, there would be, there was additional additional wells are needed to meet the projected 2050 demand, and for the purpose of this study, we looked at three 675 gallon per minute wells. We don't know what we're going to get out of a well until we drill. So this was kind of a middle of the road number of what we you know the the city has a really has a 1300 gallon per minute well, some lower capacity, two, yeah 2000. Some are are less capacity, so we kind of chose this in the middle as well, we're not, we don't know what we're gonna get until we drill. So we looked at three 675 gallon per minute wells. Um, now with, there is a potential for deferring some uh, construction of some new wells if the acquisition of some, uh, some of the existing pri private community water systems occurs. They have their own wells. Um, that has been, the city has taken over some community water system wells in the private community water system wells in the past, and some work has been, has been required to bring them up to current code and, and other standards, but that those existing wells may have the potential to defer construction of new wells. Um, in the Hillendale boosted zone, uh, there would be a, a booster station need to meet, uh, meet 2050 demands. Uh, the existing pumps cannot meet the projected demand for, for peak hour. Uh, DNR code requires that one single pump must be able to meet the current the peak hour demand without storage. So uh, the existing pumps aren't able, able to meet that. So what we do, what we decided to do is, in the plan here was to convert the, what you have already spent money on is convert Well Station 12 into a uh, booster pump station for the Hill, Hill and Dale zone. So that's utilizes your, some of your, your existing infrastructure to make use of those dollars already spent and convert that, convert that over to a booster, booster station to help meet the needs of development when that occurs over in the Hill and Dale zone. Uh, water storage improvements. Uh, there would be a, a, an additional 200,000 gallons needed uh, in the main service zone to meet the projected 2050 demands and an additional 150,000 gallons of storage in the Hillendale boosted zone, that would be used to provide fire protection, equalizing storage, and operating reserve. Currently, there is no storage in that zone. When that zone gets that, if it, when and if it does get that large, that's when storage is recommended to improve the reliability of the system for, um, for firefighting and equalizing storage, and it, and it provides a better buffering capacity. As systems gets larger without storage, having a storage tank takes a lot of, also actually kind of a surge protector for some of those areas. So that provides a nice um, buffer for that area too. There's also distribution, distribution systems improvements that were recommended. Uh, some were to address the dis existing deficiencies. Uh, areas of Lake Lower, Lake Brittany, Guernsey Mendo Meadows and Kristen Down have, so, have experienced some recent uh, it isn't recent, there has been corrosion that's been going on for years on the exterior of the water main, which has been making it much less, less reliable. Um, that was actually identified in the capital improvement plan previously. So we included that in, in part of this study because if we don't include it, we need to, wanted to show a whole picture, not since it was already in another plan, we wanted to include it here so you have an idea of where the as a system as a whole, where we're going. And then those are basically the, the existing deficiencies and then distribution system also to serve expansion for future development. So this little chart here, as you can see here, our, we have a maximum day, we rate water supply staging based on what maximum day pumping, which are the green bars. Now this is a, assuming a linear trend of growth from now until 2050. So the lower blue line represents the capacity of your existing well system. So right now, if growth were to continue, trend, continue trending on a linear, linear pat, pattern, the, the well system would be at, at capacity in around 2032, 2032, 2033. So each of the lines above that represents the addition of one, one new well. So that, then that incrementally in, increases your capacity over those time periods. 
And like we stated earlier, um, if a private water system comes on, then, then the capacity of the water system, and we incrementally, incrementally adjust those things based on what capacity the wells are. So we perform the supply and storage analysis again after, after the recommendations of, of uh, in, increasing supply capacity, booster station capacity, and uh, elevated storage capacity. And it shows that supply capacity can meet uh, the, all the requirements here based on the 2050 demand. So that's where it shows all this. So that is a check to make sure the recommendation, recommendations work with the supply and storage analysis. So this figure here generally shows the green, green lines in here are our future distribution system expansion and some for future service areas and some to bring out uh, it, uh, water system infrastructure to, to serve some of the existing uh, water systems, pri com private community water systems. Um, and uh, the, there's a the star there shows kind of a general location where we where we thought elevated storage tanks would be, uh, could be potentially located by no means are they, did we do a siting study, but they looked like this would be an appropriate location based on water modeling results to put the uh, elevated storage tanks. So in the capital improvements plan, we, we divided the improvements into short-term improvements, um, inter intermediate term improvements, sorry if I'm not speaking into this, intermediate term improvements and long-term improvements. So the short-term improvements were basically put, categorized or, or prioritized for the short-term to make sure to bring up water system to develop extension, water main extensions to bring it out to serve the 2030 service area. So if those things don't occur or don't the need, those improvements don't all need to be there. But one of the things, that, so that was ex distribution expansion, um, distribution system improvements, uh, that is for the reliability. So we included that one in the, in the first plane phase to take care of the existing corrosion. Uh, that one, uh, based on that, within engineering contingencies, we estimated a cost of $12.1 million. The intermediate term improvements start to develop the western portion of the city in the, in the Hillendale boosted zone and also includes construction of well 14 and, and converting well 12 into a booster pump station to meet demands uh, from 2030 to 2040. Uh, that one is estimated with a, a total project cost of about $8.8 .8 million. And then the long-term improvements take the system from 2040 to 2050, which then basically extends the water main to the southeastern portion of the city and, and, and adding wells uh, 15 and 16 and an additional 200,000 gallons uh, of elevated storage. And that was estimated for a total project cost of $11,200,000. Now, all of this basically can be driven by development. So this is, assuming this was all a linear pattern up to 2050, we kind of went that way and said, here's what the cost. And obviously costs are uh, dictated by what the need for development. So a lot of this could spread out for a longer period of time, but for the purpose of the study, we wanted to establish some sort of pattern. And that's how we came up with those costs and how we divided the cost into those time periods. I went through that a little, little quickly in the interest of trying to get you keep on time. Uh, do you, does anybody have any questions? And it, Tom? In this study, you looked at residential increase. Do you look at any business increase in this? Yeah, yes. Um, we pr based all of our projections based on land use. Land use, okay. So, so on land use projections, we, if in that, in that plan, if there was commercial development or multifamily development or what type of development based on the, on the 2050 projected land use, we looked at that land use as being commercial. So that was how we categorized that okay. and, and made our projections based on that land use. Super, thank you. Any other questions? Well, we still have a five-year plan that, uh, uh, that encapsulates some of those uh, uh, improvements. Is that correct? That, yeah. Correct. So a very short term. Yep. The short, short term. <laughs> short, short term. <coughs> Any other questions? 
Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate that. Appreciate your time. And I know it took a long time, but I can see why. Is this report going to continuously be available to us that we can look at it yeah. afterwards after my, mm -hmm. after my head stops spinning? I, I, yeah. I will get a, uh, another version of the report. I'll get some printed copies over here. I did, didn't want to finalize it and have a whole bunch of printed in case you had some comments and wanted some. Uh, some if you can just put it online, that'd be. Yeah, okay. All right. Great. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, and then we're going to discuss the 2020 capital budget expenditure for the Park Arthur Baseball Field Number Four. Uh, got Scott here. This was requested to just uh, review again, or just I think there were some questions and needed clarification, if I'm not mistaken. So you want to give us an overview of what was proposed in in the or what is in the budget now? Hello? Okay, good. Um, in capital projects, we uh, went in there to fix field four. Um, that's the big field uh, out there at Park Arthur. Um, the drainage just does not work. Um, I'm sorry to say the field was never designed properly. Um, we've been trying to do a Band-Aid fix probably since that field's been going. Um, so at Capitol, we requested for um, this coming year to fix field four long-term fix field one, two, and three next year. Um, the also thing to remember too is when we did decide to fix field four, we will also be pulling the horn field, $120,000 rehab. I think it's set out in 2024. We don't need this. Horn field's a backup for the four and we don't need to bring it up to grade if we do this project. So that was one of the discussion points about it. Um, basically, this is a taking the field taking it all the way down to pretty much stripping the topsoil, stripping all the field, and building the field back up to using a design standard that, um, a baseball design standard that can tell you what it is, redoing the whole field, setting it up at the right height. And when you do that, you're going to have to readjust the, basically the dugouts, the fencing will have to be adjusted, and then we're gonna have to look at looking at the light full poles of this. Um, we have studies where we went out there, we took soil borings. We know every portion of the field. We have survey shots of all portions of the field. We did, it, we did a cut and fill analysis of it. So we only have to bring in 236 cubic yards to make this project work, which is how many truckloads about? 10 to 12, 10 to 12 which is good. So you're taking, you're taking some out. Well, we're cutting and filling okay. of, of this thing. It's, we're using existing as much as we can. The only thing that- Because the existing was from the road fill, wasn't it? Wasn't that like the, the problem? We, we, we did do um, soil borings in the area because we were concerned about some of the areas of it and all the soil borings that we found, we have not found anything of concerns like concrete or something like that. That's why we did soil borings for all four fields because your concern is what our concern was. So we made sure that we know what was out there before we started this process. Um, we are at the point where the plan is to release this RFP um, the first week in February. And the plan is to, I think, after the first or second week in July, and all the baseball people know, shutting down this field and going to work and getting this field done and getting it ready for 2021. And that's this, when this was a large amount of money, wasn't it? It was. It's three hundred and fifteen thousand dollars. That's just for the one field. The next three years even more expensive. Four hundred fifty thousand. How, how in the world can we spend as much money as we spent and have something that's designed so poorly that we have to spend another $350,000 to make it work? How does that happen? That's just, it's just a, a, a sin for, for, for cost, for, for money. I mean, my God. From, from my understanding and how I approach everything, engineering, this job is no different than doing Bay Lane, doing a stormwater pond or whatever. Or redoing Moreland Road. Or yeah, we have a design standard. I, we looked at the design standard, it's a baseball design standard. That is what we start with. Once we do the design standard, we create a plan off that for fair engineering. 
Once we submit that to an RFP and we get people out there, we choose the best contractor. We also will have full inspection on it like we do for Bay Lane. We also will make sure that they do as built. We will make sure that this job is taken like an engineering job. That's how it is. From my understanding, when this was done, it wasn't approached that way. It was, hey, get this thing done. There was no inspection out there. No one knew what was going on. This is where we're at right now. It was left in the hands of the park and rec director at the time. No engineering was involved, and that's what the council authorized. And so that's, that's why we have what we have. So that that's why we have what we have. Well, I, I agree with you, Neil. I think in, it's There's not that old. It's, it's really a shame that the modern technology wasn't used at, at, at the time. Is, is there no way to save this? And why is it? I, I was out there like two hours after a major storm. The storm was major enough that I was over at a person's house helping, helping them bail their basement. <clears throat> and and there, was, there, was, there was water along the first baseline. Okay, you know, it, it doesn't seem like you'd have to bring in 12 truckloads of dirt to fill the first baseline. And, and remember, Neil, this year we had more rain yeah. in a consistent time period than we had. This has been while. ongoing. I mentioned at the meeting that... Um, Wayne Delacott had come to me a number of times. This is not just now. This has always been an issue. We would get complaints well, Ryan, all the time Ryan from the ball too, clubs. Like the it's meeting. been yeah. always been a problem. Always. It's not just this year. It, the, the idea of doing band-aid fixes is we've been trying, DPW, we've been trying to do this for, for a long time, the band-aid fixes. It, we're at that point where it's just not working. Um, these band-aid fixes doing it. The field wasn't designed right. I'm, I'm not gonna, I, I have all the survey shows of like how it trains from one side to the other. It, it just, in my opinion, no one would design a field this way. And because we have, here's where we're at. If you have a dry year and there is no, no rain, not gonna be a problem. But everything pitches from one side of the field all the way to the other. And it will be, the, the point of it is, maybe initially it will rain, but then it keeps going and it keeps going and it keeps going and the next couple of days keep getting wet. When Kurth Field, which is done properly, you go out there, you can fix it up a little bit, they're playing the next day. Or even if the rain is early in the morning, you can play the next day. That's the point of trying to get this field right so that we can do this. So, and, so the clubs, were they, were they complaining about the field out there? They, they complained about the field, but all remember the also too, time. We host tournaments out there. Mm -hmm. Not this Find, year, then. <laughs> no, I, nope. Not next year. No, finding fields oh, for for this year. finding fields for hosting tournaments is becoming a popular, popular thing. We need with this. If it rains in the morning, we can go in there and fix those fields and, and get them up. Um, it, it's <clears throat> yeah, it's our only complex with lights too. This is this is the one where they can do double headers. They can, mm -hmm. you know, this is, Got this lights. is the Primo yeah. Fields. I, I'm not going to. Was the Horn Project a budgeted project or not? It, it was a capital project five years out, 2024. Okay. Okay. I had it for $120,000. And the reason why is if you can't play on Field Ford, you can go play on Horn. Right. But if you spend the money on this, I already said, I'd pull it. There's no need to spend the $120,000. Okay. If there's a really bad brainstorm and you need to use a backup field, you're going to go out there, but there's not going to be ADA compliance so in the you'll benches. Be about two and a quarter, then, if you don't spend the money. Yeah. So, so re regardless of what, how it got this way, we've got a problem. We've got to <laughs> fix that problem, fix and I don't see any other alternative other than to do what Scott's recommending. Well, we had this all budgeted anyhow, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You guys approved this all and I everything. Just called it back just because yep. it's it seems Large like holy macro. It's a substantial Fish. amount of money. I agree. And this is one of two. That's a large yeah. amount of money. Yeah. And, yeah. And you know, if we're working three quarters of a million dollars on baseball fields to fix them the second time, yeah. which just doesn't seem like it's a good use of resources, people. That's why I'll remind you why we consolidated the departments and have an engineer heading up yeah. all the parks <clears> and everything. Good God. <clears throat> it can't happen again. Just for the sake of discussion, if we uh, address for, uh, field number four this way at this time, uh, will there be any chance of delaying the others for the sake of stretching the money out further? Um, you know, we, we could see, I mean, it's just in the capital. It's, it's, it's one, two, three, four hundred fifty thousand dollars 
the biggest thing is, let's see how good this one goes. And then we can always push it. It's not like it's, if you got field four and, and you get one, two, and three, but I think we have back of fields four, one, two, and three. Um, I believe Bloom is, is possible, the same thing. Um, Dunoon and Kurt, Kurth are also backup fields. We only have one backup field for this four in its horn. Mm -hmm. So there's potential too, where we have other fields that we can play with one, two, and three um, when we do it. it. We can look at spreading that out. The biggest thing is doing cut fills. You don't wanna to have too much cut, you don't wanna to have too much fill. Cost of trucking, shipping stuff in and out. We got field four where you only have to bring 10 truck, truck loads in. That's nothing. It's when you start bringing in, I need 500 trucks worth of fill. It's going to get really darn expensive really quick. And so we've been looking at trying to balance this site back and forth. Four, we got one, two, and three. Um, it's going to be a little bit more of a challenge for us. And, and we're, 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 we're trying to figure out how we're going to do this because we, we got to make sure that we don't spend all this money on hauling fill in. That's not the point of this. So... John, I think we need to look at the budget next year and see what else is in there. Yeah, I'm just that's wondering if the whole total if package. That's something we can work with if, if we're feeling too pressed by this. If we if we go ahead with this first part and then we feel too pressed, uh, do we have some, some wiggle room? We, we have more backups for one, two, and three. Like I said, no. the other fields, four, we just have one. Mm -hmm. But so. I think I think we did talk about this of putting it into the budget there was two a lot, years of, back a lot to back. of companies too that invested in field four now you're tearing it apart on them you know and it just seemed like man uh, what you don't talk about a black eye for the city um we got to tear, tear apart all the all the money that you gave and you know, the contribution that you made uh, people that that did fencing i think there was people that did concrete mm -hmm. i think there's people that did did the uh lighting uh, thing parts out there mm -hmm. and now we're just telling them well you know it's just going to be all scrapped it's all gone we're going to tear down all the fencing we're going to pull all the fence posts we're going to pull all the concrete and we're just going to start over again holy mackerel there just doesn't seem to be an alternative though mm -hmm. no i think i think that if you don't do it you're going to eventually have more to do. It sounds like, from an engineering standpoint. I mean, boy, oh boy. Correct. They want it right. Yep. And, and it is a nice facility that that has lights. I thought it was. I don't mm -hmm. know. Evidently, oh, I was wrong. That's, that <laughs> when we don't play on it, we don't know if it's good or not. <clears throat> They know. <laughs> Looking down the road then too, if we if we wind up fixing all of these fields, does that set us for one decade, two decades? No, what's no, that, no, you don't do this school? again. This this type this is this is not something we do again. This is this is just, then it's just general maintenance. This is something that you should have sh been done from the beginning. Correct. That's the best way to put it. Like you shouldn't have to do this. But here we are. Yeah. Well, we can begin to stock for you, uh, stockpile fill from developments in the city for the other diamonds, I would assume. Okay. Yep. Right. Sure. Yeah, yeah we're, we're, we're looking at every angle possible to keep the cost down as, as low as can. So, so there's, there's no need for any action, so I assume there's, we'll just continue on. It's already in the budget. I just updated you. Unless okay. somebody wants to make a motion, are you, you satisfied? Well, you know, I'm not happy about it now. Um, I don't know, think we all are. I, you know, nobody is. I just think it was really, it's too really soon for poor use of, of resources. And we couldn't agree more, which is back to what I said. We consolidated departments and put an engineer in charge so that we will not see this again. You, you know, I did make the analogy of Moreland Road, we, we had the same dilemma there. We put that road in and then it was failing. So we, we did the whole thing from Chainsville just past Woods at a cost of a lot of money. Thank goodness somebody wrote some grants on that, but uh, it still was very expensive for us to redo a road that probably didn't, you know, before it's time to be redone. So I think I think we're in the same dilemma here with, with the park. And, and it is a showcase, I mean, it, it, you know, it's a it's a nice development out there, and we probably should keep it that way. 
Okay, we'll move on. Thank you both. Um, discuss vacated police department facility. Um, this was actually the first, well, last meeting, but we didn't know we weren't gonna have a full council. We could have, but um, this is the first opportunity that to have a real discussion when the building's been vacated. And I say very recently because the IT has had things in there and I was being patient. She asked me, Barb asked me to wait a bit. Um, she's had a lot of projects and I, if I can take a moment, everybody works hard, but Chief, you'll agree that woman has put in so much time with all these facilities, lots of overtime, lots of calling in on Saturdays and Sundays and you name it, Scott, correct? Yeah. And uh, she didn't complain much. A little bit every now and then, but um, so she asked for a little time to slowly work at getting all the IT things over. And um, so anyhow, uh, did you hand this out already? If they have okay, I, there's a memo that uh, we work together on so that you could have some background information. And then there's also what Chief titles as the old PD issues here so that everybody understands the current issues basically with the facility as it sits today and then some uh, considerations. So I guess I could go through um, one is we could parcel the land for sale as was talked about. That would mean, I mean truly parceling it off. Um, the staff and I do not recommend this because the property is within uh, the city campus between city hall and police station, that's park settlement center. Um, a potential future use could be a fire station that provides full-time um, department, including sleeping quarters. And the reason that came up as we, or I did, had a brief chat with uh, the fire chief and they said that would be wise to consider that maybe someday down the road. But I wanna pause and tell you what I learned the first two years I was in office, so in 2011 and 12, um, the, 80% of all fire departments throughout the entire country are volunteer. The only reason, because now we have so many fire safety things in place and whatever, the only real reason you have to go to full-time is when you simply run out of volunteers. As long as we have volunteers, there's no reason to go full-time. They feel confident they'll be volunteer for a long time, but no one can guarantee that. Nobody knows what happens, so. But they thought that would be good and then all the other stations wouldn't be needed anymore. They would just, have one for with the sleeping quarters. So that's one consideration. The other one is leave it vacant as is. This is highly not recommended by the staff and I, because you, it'll be rodent infested, it, infested, it'll um, deteriorate, become unsightly. We don't allow that for anyone else in the city, so we should not do that ourselves. Item three is demolish the entire building and create needed parking for Veterans Memorial Park. Um, municipal court, because if you can see, we run out of space for that. And elections on election day, especially this November, it's unfortunate we can't have it gone and parking there then. Um, and then four is demolish the office building section and maintain the garage for cold storage and added needed parking, again, for vets and court and elections. Um, this option will require plan commission approval for aesthetics. Uh, we also happen to know that the electrical, am I correct, Scott? It's the electrical that is on the exterior, um, well, it's in the, the office building piece, so there'd have to be an addition to the garage to house that. So these are things if you're considering, we more information would have to be um, sought out. And then number five is anything else the call wishes to discuss. So I turn it over to you for your discussions. And of course, if it's maintained for any purpose, then there's ongoing maintenance and insurance that has to be carried. I, I like. I like option number four. If we're looking, if we're just looking at what's on here, um, without knowing enough about it, just at, on the surface here, uh, the cold storage. I don't know. DP, it, it's a low roof, right? I mean, is it is that is it high enough for storage? What's that? You want to come? Why don't you guys come up to the table, sit, and share the yeah. microphone? And and the other question I have is with the new building. Did, did we not just add to our yeah. cold storage facilities? And now we're 
We're well, still, we we're still a, short. We have a, a lot of, um, I guess you could say, implements, our leaf suckers, our seasonal stuff that instead of rotating in and out and putting a puzzle in every day to put the trucks back in this time of the year, we put all the seasonal stuff. Um, some's down at Boxhorn, some is at the old PD, which we're hoping once we redo Boxhorn that we can hide more stuff down there. But as far as the, the building, I, I, I don't remember the garage area. I remember walking through the police station, and there, that's I why we have a new police foot. station. But it has a nine-foot door on the north end, and the other two uh, doors on the side are seven. But the structure is pretty good. I mean, that's just a slab, right? And well, yeah, right. The, the so garage is the garage like is the police pretty station. good. It's probably the the best. I would assume best part of the building, uh, most recent. <laughs> yeah, but a, a roof is maintenance stuff. But the idea of cold storage is well, the more we can store s equipment inside, yeah. it lasts longer, you know, and, and the <clears throat> fact that it's just there. When when the mayor brought up the electrical part, just to let you know, if you go on the outside of the building, kind of the side of there, the electric comes up to the building. That's your main electrical source. You cut the building off just to the one side of electric because that means you don't have to change your electrical source. You're trying to save money, but that would establish a front to the building. It would be maybe you know 10 to 12 feet more into the existing old PD. And that portion you would have to make aesthetically pleasing per plan commission. But why you make the cut there is you don't have to run another line of elect electrical in there. Um, there's no basement under the parking. Um, it, it's just flat on slab. Would, would we need plumbing there or we need to add restrooms or anything? I, I, I don't know. For the Natural park cold or, storage. I'm just saying because it's off a park area as well. I mean, we're set with everything in yeah, the park got, right now. Got, we got bathrooms restrooms. out there. We got, you know, everything you need. Water runs to the place. That's why I'm saying water's yeah. already there. I don't know if we need to use anything for if, water. If you, have to, if you have to add maybe one bathroom, I don't think it's going to be an issue. But at the same time, too, if you need to use a bathroom, you park there. City Hall's right here as well. You know, it, it's, it's we're, we're just talking cold storage. Boxhorn, okay. we don't have a bathroom. Well, obviously, because it's off a of park, and, and I don't know exactly what we want to do with that land. I'm I, I'm looking at that as, as you know, we're, we're talking putting parking lot in, it, and I'm thinking maybe we need to expand the, the grounds a little bit more because we took some away when we built the PD, and I know the festival committee is not happy with losing uh, ground out there, and uh, you know, rightly so. They've been doing it for years, and they're a volunteer type environment. Um, I, I understand their concerns, so that's that's one of my concerns about number five mixing into number four. How do we approach that without making it all parking? Because I'm not sure we need all that parking. I mean, the festival can we would prefer parking? Well, I understand that, but but we we you know how much parking do we need? Because I know they lost it for this area, but when we designed this building, we did it with the enough parking spots available. And if we if we again if we're looking at hindsight, you know, shame on us again. But uh, um, I, I, I like to see some type of mix between four and five. Um, just talking out loud here, uh, I think the cold storage, if we have the building to keep it, um, if we can do it for a minimal cost and add some parking and, and open up the, the grounds a little bit, make it a little cleaner out there, that it flows more as a bigger open space. <clears throat> um, one thing just with the festival this year and maybe the chief does we they were out of the building and the festival was able to park some of their employees in the pd area where they couldn't before behind the old pd so they did find a little advantage of it so i think it worked out pretty well for them where they could park some of their vendors and some of the other people there they, they, they could use that space so there was parking because well we added parking too on yeah uh, we pioneer. added a bunch of parking on on pioneer, pioneer. but they were also able to use spaces in the old PD that they couldn't before because the PD was an active site. So I don't know how it did work, but from my understanding, everything seemed to work out good. Maybe Chief, you you know, I think it worked out good. They had a little bit more parking for their staff there it, that they never had before. So, I just want to reiterate. I can't even say it here. <clears throat> you know, I like to see more of a flow of the common ground area go into that area. Um, to keep it, the campus open for future use. You never know where, where this can go. Um, I mean, number one is talking about a fire department. I mean, it could be a million other things as far as the campus goes. And that's kind of why we built this, the way we built this, reusing the city hall and moving the police station into it uh, and building off of that. So we, we, we try to keep that campus environment. And I like to, 
I definitely want to keep the land. I don't think selling is a good idea at all, um, at least at this point. I'd like to point out the additional parking is needed. At, if nothing, it's the event park and national night out and everything else. There's just not enough parking. Mm -hmm. Festival too, Festival is requesting more asphalt there. There's there's so, not enough parking here for municipal court. I correct. Mean, on a day like tomorrow, this room will be filled and mm -hmm. jam-packed, and people will be coming in to see me saying, they had to park on Pioneer. Yeah. They had to park at the old police and walk over. They had to park across the street. So I don't know if anybody, if we ever took that into consideration, but mm -hmm. there just isn't enough parking. I, for I bet you when they design the building, no offense, you're, you're talking one point, one anomaly. Are you right. gonna create all this parking for one time event? Right. Um, again, you know, we, we try to add as much as we could on Pioneer. Uh, I got the one MST grant for free. We, we added the more there. Um, it, it is, it's, it's just less parking. Um, court's busy. I'm not going to lie to you to there. Um, when we do the beer garden and it's a successful night, you guys can see park people parking up and down Pioneer. When it's a festival, you're never going to have enough parking for those one day events and nor should you create all this asphalt. But the, the extra parking that's in there now around it, it is helpful. It is helpful for the festival. It is helpful right now. It is. So, and for the regular court, yeah. and then even the occasional elections, we need it. So. Yeah, and exact ele elections. So, I think number four makes the most sense. I mean, you, you can't repurpose the building; it's got too many issues. The, the know, whole reason that we built a new police department was because we had those issues, right. as well as we had some issues that were brought to us by yeah. law enforcement things that just didn't work out so good. So, you know that that this is this is old information, but. Uh, you know, it's um, it's why we didn't use the building in the first place. And um, I, would I say, don't I don't know if you want to if you want to go whole hog on building parking lots or anything, but um, I, I think I think we do also rent a building, do we not, in the industrial park for our, our rec department? No, uh, for, no. For no. We, since we bought for, that building for no. their rain days. No. We don't? Yes. No. We used to. We did, we, she did one year. Is that one year? Only one year. Is it, would it be worthwhile considering something She uses like that? Old Town Hall now, for the most part. Well, see, that that's a, brings a whole other dilemma in. If you build the front on that, can you put offices in it? Well, yeah, maybe, it, may, it doesn't have to necessarily be part of the same I mean, building. <coughs> You right. get free of the land. campus in, in the long run. You're right. So, I mean, that's something to look at. I mean, definitely a study of some type is going to need to be done here before we put some money together to take a look at doing something with that property. Well, the um, birth rate is down significantly. Um, I know the school district did a big study on that, and the Across recreation the department has felt that pain. The uh, summer program, the kids aged out, and it, oh, I think it's less than half. It's so down. they don't need this as big summer, a facility. This, this summer is, it's, it's down. It's the, down. The past summer was down. Hmm. Consistent, not just here, because Tammy called around. It's consistent everywhere. So, I, I think number four is our starting point, and as has already been referenced, I think uh, we get rid of the problems by getting rid of the part of the building that we would uh, that we would get re remove, and then. Uh, Using that as a starting point, the future's bright. You got you got a lot that you can use with that garage area yet for years to come. And who knows what would come up down the road where we want to modify that building again. Starting with that, we've got something. Um, I'm totally uh, against trying to uh, dismiss this property or um, totally demolish that building when we've got uh, a lot of potential with that garage area. So I hear consensus. Would you like the staff to get more information on demolishing the office piece yep. and saving the garage? Yep. Yes. yes. Okay. We'll do that. I don't think we need a motion for that because that's just looking into getting the info. Okay. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Um, and final one is uh, Alderman Wolf requested discuss future win the uh, <coughs> future winter decorations. I don't know why it says future, but. <laughs> So I'm looking to you. Oh, we, uh, we, we're going to, I guess we're planning to uh, expand this. It was kind of a discussion in the original 
I mean, it's been going on for years. We finally got decorations, and then this was the first go around, right? According to uh, the budget meetings, I, I just brought up a, a scenario that uh, I mean, I, I like the decorations. I unfortunately I see one is out already. I don't know, maybe it's um, maybe it's just unplugged. I don't know uh, that they're all white, and with the white LED lights, maybe we need to add some. If we go to second round, add some color in there, put some greens and reds in the same styles or something. Otherwise, you can keep it white. That's fine too. I just. I just thought with the LED lights shining down, it's pretty white, but it, it looks nice. But I just wanted to throw an opinion out there and have everybody see which direction we should go with in the future. You want me to jump in? Or they're seasonal? Uh, just, just for the winter. Well, no. Just want to give winter. everyone a highlight here. Okay. <clears throat> One, these the, the snowflake lights are, are LED. They're white lights. Um, last year, the planter beds got replaced, so they're LED lights that are showing up, a little bit more significant white. Um, you guys approved. It's coming down in like, did they start yet? Or January pinky for you're going to see all chains will roll. You know, how, like the halogens, different colors. That's all going LED. That was approved. So it's going to look a very clean white LED look um, very efficient for us. Now, the second thing is before we go a little crazy, the next set of lights, just to give an update, I would like either Ryan or Adam, they know more which ones are receptacles and which are not because when we went out there, not all the poles have a plug-in. So we want to give you a highlight so that you're like, oh, let's just not take it all the way down to anywhere else. So maybe Ryan can talk about that as well. So right now there's 17 snowflakes out. Um, the only poles that have receptacles are what you see right now. There's one more receptacle um, in front of Arby's so would, which would make 18. Besides that, the poles on the outside of Janesville on the north and south side of it, from Parkland to Lannan, are loaded with the permanent um, cocktail metal braces, and then they have our braces for the banners that go up seasonal. So there's limited room, and especially with clearance heights with semis and everybody going on the road, I don't think it's feasible to add lights anywhere else. Um, I did contact the Snowflake supplier to see if we could eventually put them back to back. So it'd be doubles down the middle and it's not feasible because of the way the brackets are set up. You could do it, but one Snowflake would be higher. You'd have to pick a side going down. Aesthetically, that would drive me nuts, but <laughs> I look at the small things with that stuff. Um, I don't know if we need to double them. Yeah. I, I, right. The I'm, other. I'm good the way they are. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah me too. We're good. <laughs> we're good. <laughs> now, I've heard we're nothing fine. but positive. Right. So. Okay. <laughs> but now we have no outlets, so we're looking at no expansion. No expansion on, as you see, Janesville right now. So on Pioneer, from the from Horn Park to Janesville, there's 24 poles, all have receptacles. The ones that are out on jeans right now are pretty big, but they fit the area. Um, they're 90 bulbs a piece and they weigh 75 pounds. And, and if you put them on Pioneer, someone that's getting residential, I mean, it's kind of a mix, isn't it, down there? It's getting, and I mean, Adam has done the research and kind of went through everything, but to put in perspective, those are five foot snowflakes. Um, if you put a five foot snowflake on Pioneer, it would stick out like a sore thumb. So you can get smaller ones for less cost. The problem I have, I don't have a problem with it, but just on my end, what it takes to do it. To put it in perspective, when we put up flags in the springtime, along with the banners, we do all of Janesville, Moreland, and we call it the Test Corners area. That's 282 flags, which is fine. I mean, everybody loves it. I have no problem doing it. It takes me three guys two weeks to put them up and three guys two weeks to put them down. And that's just flags and banners. Now, with these snowflakes... So that's a month right there for flags and banners. With the snowflakes, I'm going to leave the brackets on the poles, but it'll probably with traffic control because you take up more room, probably take me three guys, probably four even, just because of the weight of them. Probably another week and a half to two weeks just for the 17 to 18 snowflakes. So as we keep ordering these, it's going to take more time. And I say this because when we put them up, is right in the middle of leaf collection. So it's a little harder to... You know, I'm already taking three or four guys off a of leaf collection for the two weeks they're in leaf collection when this year was 
not the optimal time to do it when we were getting October snow. But as we keep adding this stuff comes the time away from other services that we already provide. I have no problem doing it. I just want to kind of put that in perspective because also storing these 75 pound five foot snowflakes, we kept all the boxes because that's the only way I can store them. So now I have to store 18 boxes and they come six by six by a foot. So the more we add, the more area I'm going to need to store also. That's one, you know, cool one of the comments too related to color, you know, when we chose the white, it was something that was meant to be winter, not a holiday because of exactly what Ryan mentioned with, with his crew being busy and up and down. The thought was they go up once beginning of the winter season and they don't have to hopefully come down maybe until you're doing the banners and flags in the spring or whatever it is. So there's not as much, yeah, at least shut them off. So there's not as much up and down. And so the same thing, it's using more practical use of, of time rather than if you have something that's very specific holiday colored per se, you, you can't get away with them being up but there as long. You, you could put ho uh, red lights in them or green lights in them and keep them the same. But but if we don't have the outlets, it's kind of voiding the whole thing. I mean, it, you, you got a whole other dollar amount to put in. And, and uh, I mean, I don't know what direction we were going to go on this. Were we going to try to do the Moreland Janesville area? Um, were we going to do the Test Corner area? I mean, what, what was some of the plans? We were, This was like just a start. There really wasn't. Um as we keep moving forward, Scott and I have talked about keep on upgrading that with uh, LED throughout the areas. Uh, Test Corners has high-pressure sodium bulbs. It's that orange glow. So metal halide is along Pioneer right now. It's almost equivalent to LED. I would say if you would want to add anything, we do some smaller flakes down Pioneer for time being until we can get other upgraded areas. Those all have receptacles on all 24 poles. Um, a long, long time ago, we did garland. It's not my favorite thing. Down on uh, <laughs> Test Corners area. And Thank you, Ryan. That's <laughs> when the mayor was in the chamber. <laughs> but it, it, like I said, it just comes with time and maintenance. And I agree with Adam. I mean, you have that white light, and we have, through the controls we have through the boxes, we're able to come February if it's 50 degrees and sunny out and we don't get an opportunity to get out there yet, I can just shut the receptacles off and they can stay up there so I can get to them in early March or if it's still snowing in April, whatever. But I think people, once they're done with this season, they're not gonna to wanna to see snowflakes on either, so. Well, I think that right now it sounds like we're gonna put this on hold. Yeah. So. Yep. And talk about it in the future and- But don't add any to Pioneer right now? Don't- I use. wouldn't think so. I would think the Janesville area is more important to, I'm not to do with. I'm not going to argue with you, Lana. <laughs> Are you sure, Ryan? <laughs> okay. Thank you all very much. Okay. Communications, miscellaneous business, I have none. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? We are adjourned.